since the sun is moving through space and the planets are flying around the sun, generating this huge vortices as it follows the equator of the sun. It, that is a completely different picture. All right? It goes from flat to spacious, to movement through space. And that makes a big difference. All of a sudden, you start to see that even planetary motion, solar motions around the galaxy, galactic motion, supercluster motion, and so on, all have this elliptical, vorticular dynamics of space. They all have this torque dynamic through space. And, uh, and if you look at the Earth... On this vortex, you could say that this is 2,000, you know, 2,000, for instance, and this would be then uh, 2,000, 2,001, and then this would be 2,002, and this would be, uh, this is extremely long distance apart, millions and millions and millions and millions of miles apart. There's nothing in there, the, the, you know, the planets do not come back onto their path. They don't. If they did, we most likely would have the same set of information over and over and over, like a broken record. Okay? And, uh, and we, we'd probably get real bored. Uh, uh, it would be like Groundhog Year, you know? <laughs> and so... Um, it, what makes, and it, so it hit me in my head, oh my God, oh what makes, what makes every second, every billion of a second different from the other, every part of the division of space-time different from the other, and why is information changing, is because we are never moving back onto the same coordinates of space-time, we're moving through space-time, gathering information through the system and feeding it back and, uh, and modifying the structure of space as we move through it. So it was really an important realization. It, it had implication in the physics I was writing, but as well it had implications in, in, in uh, psychology theories and stuff that, you know, I was interested in because, because you could, I, and I've experienced and experimented on this since then, where, where I, if I give this visualization at, to somebody, and I ask them in their mind's eye to move the earth back along that vortex to an instance, to something that happened in their life that was traumatic. I'm able to get these people to go back to that moment much, in much more vivid and much more powerful way. And then what I ask them to do is to change their visualization of that experience from their perspective to what to the 180 degree perspective, like to the perspective of the person that assaulted them or whatever. And then they get a new set of information. And what I believe happens is that new set of information is encoded in that place in space-time, and so all of the rest of the information is changed from there on. And, and that is actually the, the, the effect of psychology, asking you to go back to an instance. But if you don't know, and, and I think that's where psychology could get some help from this theory, is that if you don't know the true dynamics, the fundamental mechanics of that motion through space, you're going to try to visualize it in something that's going back in time on the same record, broken record, so you can't get there, right? Uh, and, but here, I've had instances where people were able to do that and solve some very, very important issues immediately. And what happens is that if they're there in present time, then all their forward, all the geometry that, that catch up with them now opens a whole new set of geometry for them in the future. So um, that was really exciting. So I was on this, um, on this bank of, uh, 
of the uh, of the lake, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I've got something here. I gotta I gotta think about. I I want to do an experiment to do something to to be able to you know show this. Is am I correct? You know, and I thought, how could I experiment to show a 3D kind of 3D wave instead of a flat wave? And and uh, and I thought, okay, well, if I have a spinning motor that would that would give me the torque of space time and and I attach the string to it, maybe I could I mean, let, let's see what it does, you know. So um, I, I went back to my van and I'm looking for an electrical motor. I couldn't use the V8 engine of my car. Uh, I you know I I, I was looking around, so I, I finally found one in the razor. Um, that I was using, it was an electrical razor. So I, I, I took the head out of the razor and I, I dislodged the motor. And then my razor was stuck in my experiment for a long time, so I, I grew a beer. <laughs> I, I did. Here's me with the beer. And, and so, because uh, I had no razor, and so my, my, my rope, I took a little fishing rope, Rope and I, I took a, a little bit of a, of a weight, you know, fishing weight that had a swivel on it, and I attached it to it, and I turned the razor on, and the result was so exciting. Um, I was amazed at the result because as soon as I turned it on, it went into coherent waveforms, and I used to go around physics talks with my little razor and my little string going around showing people about a 3D waveform and it was kind of funny. I, I'm going to demonstrate to you what happens when you spin um, uh, and, when, and when angular momentum is applied to a string and, um, and this is what happened here. Uh, so if I can have lights down, let me try to get this going. Okay, so here we are, and so we just we've got uh, little motors that are gonna spin this, and here's the coherent waveform, and here with the strobe I can stop the waveform that's actually a 3D wave, and can you everybody see that this becomes a a, a, a 2D sine waves and that's how we visualize it but actually if I show you the whole thing then you see that it's actually a 3D vortex right spinning in space so let me show you again uh, I gotta change the strobe frequency there we go and can you see how it becomes it seems to be a sine wave but it actually is a result of a vorticular action of, um, of a rotating system. Here's a nice uh, stable interference waveform. And uh, interestingly, when you look at the central part of these waveforms, you can see um, structures that look like Mendelbrot uh, fractal structures. And you can get much more complex one. Oh, this is a simpler one. This is a two wave. There's a three wave. I like that one particularly. There we go. Here's the, here's the uh, sine wave in, uh, in strobe stop. Can everybody see that? And then you can get, like I said, very uh, complex interference pattern. Uh, um, that you would expect from wave dynamics. This is a stable one. There we go. Here's a pulse. Here is highly complex waveform. 
So, uh, lights up. <laughs> this is my string theory. <laughs> and and uh, it's a toy, but I think that it's a toy that actually has a lot of significance in the way things work and how physics functions. 